We come to the conclusion of this text. And with this conclusion, there are two basic aspects. One is a description of a path of development that results in awakening. The next is the fulfillment of the intention of those bhikkhunis. This latter aspect gives us a bit more uh, of an opportunity to attend to uh, social material. So we'll take a look at that briefly as well. We've come to this point through an examination of impermanence, the impermanence of our senses in particular, which is to say, our experience of perception. All perception is impermanent. That can be known both because of the observation of the objects that are perceived, and also because of an analysis of that which is perceiving. We observe clearly that our eyes, our ears, our bodies, our minds are all impermanent. That which sees is impermanent. That which hears is impermanent. That which, that which feels is impermanent. The consciousness of seeing, whether seeing in or seeing out, that consciousness is impermanent. The consciousness of hearing, whether hearing in or hearing out, that consciousness is impermanent. Consciousness of feeling, whether feeling in or feeling out, all of that is impermanent. That consciousness, while being impermanent, is something which we often grasp onto, identify with, depend upon, and therefore that consciousness is suffering. It's the definition of suffering. These five aggregates, consciousness being the last, associated with craving, associating with, associated with lust, connected with grasping. That is suffering. I was on a uh, podcast, uh, a Sea Realm podcast, about an interesting modern author named Thomas Ligotti. Ligotti makes a, is a horror writer of the truest form. Uh, and his writing is based on the horror of, of our real lives. And real lives, in this case, means simply that we are conscious. He considers this to be the greatest horror. Because all of our suffering comes simply from our consciousness. If we weren't conscious, we wouldn't suffer. And so, it's his hope that through his writing, everyone will become so horrified by consciousness that we'll quit. We'll stop maintaining consciousness. Now, I have a great deal of sympathy and admiration for his position. The question isn't what, the question is how. How do we do it? Well, good news, this is how you do it. He doesn't have an answer to that question, but we do. This is how you come to the cessation of consciousness. And you might be concerned. You might say, but wait, doesn't all the joy of life also come from, happy, come from consciousness? The happiness, the joy, the pleasure. The fulfillment, the satisfaction, doesn't that come from consciousness as well? Well, I'd ask you, is that true? There's only one way to find out, isn't there? Experience the cessation of consciousness and see if those things cease also. You just have to find out. Because if you just imagine the cessation of consciousness, that's not the cessation of consciousness. That's imagination, which is consciousness. In particular, probably when you imagine the cessation of consciousness, you're just imagining restful states. You're imagining a blank screen, things are very quiet, and you're not feeling much. And you think of that as the cessation of consciousness. Without noticing that it's utterly obvious that at that moment, you're very conscious. What are you conscious of? A blank screen, a blank mental screen. You're not seeing it much. Quiet, you're not hearing much, and peace, you're not feeling much. It's amazing that something so obvious could, be, could go unnoticed. 
But I've had lots of discussions with people and I ask them, what would it be like to not have consciousness? And they say, oh, just sort of black. I say, well, that's not a lack of consciousness. That's totally conscious. And there's black right here, you see? You're conscious of that black. <laughs> that's consciousness. It's not a lack of consciousness by any means. It's certainly not the cessation of consciousness. <coughs> you could just as well say that, that being aware of the white is a cessation of consciousness. It's obvious that that's not a cessation of consciousness. We just like daytime better because of the, our preference for visual senses. That we think of black as being somehow la less conscious. It's ridiculous. Furthermore, we don't notice that those very restful states are pleasant. People love them. In fact, people come to me often complaining that they can't experience them. Say, oh, my mind is just going all the time. I'm thinking about so many things. Oh, I have so many big overwhelming emotions. Isn't there some way for me to experience a calming of all that so that things are a little more restful? That I'm not thinking so much all the time. So, not, so it's delusional in both ways. First of all, there's the claim if there was no consciousness, everything would be terrible. There wouldn't be anything wonderful. And my proof is, here's an example of what a lack of consciousness would be like. Okay, so this is the lack of consciousness, and it is joyless. It's an awful experience. It's amazing, isn't it? Both of those claims are wrong, and obviously wrong, and yet we still believe in them. That's why we come here. That's why we investigate. That's why we come here to look closely at what's really happening so that our assumptions don't push us around anymore. We have to see this clearly, that the assumptions we make, that we hold on to, that we don't question, are our enemies. For that reason, because what we hold on to, what we believe is true, is so dangerous, what we deeply believe is true, deeply in our bones, I'm saying, what we really, deep down, in the deep mind, believe is true. That is our savior and that is our undoing. It can be either our friend or our enemy, depending on if it's true or not. Because we hold on to it, whether it's true or not, this metaphor is given, that we cut through our attachment to that, cut through the delight and lust for those views, carving away the defilements, the fetters, and the bonds. That metaphor is given regarding a sacred, uh, precious thing. And that's just how it is for us. Whatever is most sacred and precious, that's what we have to cut through, even if that feels like cutting through our own heart. But the question is, how do you do it? This question was asked yesterday. Okay, so we hear about this knife, we hear about adya panya, adya prajna, this noble wisdom you see here, the noble wisdom that cuts away the defilements. How does that actually work? It's an excellent question. I gave a brief answer, but there's a much more extensive answer that's given here. We have given an entire retreat to this point, the seven enlightenment factors. These seven enlightenment factors are what result in true wisdom. <coughs> we develop them, we cultivate them, and in so doing, we gain true wisdom, like the butcher's knife. Uh, since we've given a whole retreat to it, I'm just going to go over this briefly. <coughs> but even this may be helpful to you. So, Let's look at this simple paragraph very closely. Sisters, there are these seven enlightenment factors through the development and cultivation of which a bhikkhu, by realizing for himself with direct knowledge, here and now enters upon and abides in the, the deliverance of mind and deliverance by wisdom that are taintless with the destruction of the taints. The first and most important thing to say about that sentence is it's incredible. What uh, manifestation of brilliance. 
of authority, of clarity. Nothing is more important to say, no matter what context this is put in, and that sentence is the result of very wise people learning how to speak clearly. Every word there has significance, which we need to hear. The development and cultivation, it's emphasized. Some of you know the name of this place. What's the name of this place? The organization that we're a part of. Community. Experience Experience and Development. development of awakening and responsibility. So this point, development and cultivation, is emphasized. It's about development. It's not about just wishing for something and being annoyed that it's not here yet. That's a teenage way of looking at things, but this section of the text is for adults. Actually, it's not even a teenage way of looking at things. It's a toddler way of looking at things. Some of you may have interacted with toddlers. They don't have a lot of patience, at least in my experience with toddlers. Maybe the toddlers you've worked with have a great deal of patience. But the toddlers I've worked with have very little patience. When they want something, they want it now, and when they don't want something, they want it to go away now. Not interested so much in development, cultivation. But that's our job. It's our job to understand at this stage anyway that there is such a thing as development and cultivation. There is (coughs) a period before when it's okay to be a toddler and there's a period after when it's needed to be a toddler or even younger than a toddler, actually. But in this stage, we're at the adult stage, the middle (laughs) stage. And it's like this fire that I've pointed out a few times. You can put wood into the fire. You put wood into the fire. It doesn't mean it's going to blaze right away. And we can become frustrated with that. Say, why isn't it blazing perfectly the way I want it to blaze right away? So we go over to it and we mess with it and we shuffle it around and we close it again and then we look at it and glare and wish it would change. And then we go back in again and push things around a little bit more. Like, why isn't it just blazing? I already put the wood in. That was 20 or 30 seconds ago. It should be blazing by now. Regardless of the temperature in the room, which is already quite warm, still want it to blaze right now. Blaze, huh? But it doesn't listen. So we get involved again. That's just like us with our practice. We concentrate on our breath for a few seconds. Uh, Well, it didn't work. (laughs) Wonder what I should do now. I've got it. Think about things. I'm going to give that a lot of time. That's what I should really develop and cultivate. Worrying about things that I know I shouldn't be worrying about, often I don't actually care about, and which have repeatedly proven to cause me suffering. We need to give this breath a bit of time. Got our breath. (sighs) See, even that probably made some of us a little impatient. (laughs) Come on. That was a long breath. Why doesn't it have it in a short breath? Therefore, it's emphasized that we have development and cultivation, knowing that it takes time. You put the wood in, it has to heat up. It takes time. Too many of us, too much of the time, think that time is an enemy. That time is the problem. The longer it takes, the worse it is. This has always been a problem, but in modern days, it's a serious problem. We want everything right away. The development and cultivation of patience is not taken seriously nowadays. If something doesn't happen right away, then it's flawed. But the fact is, it is happening right away. There's nothing wrong with wood taking a little while to heat up. Consider what it would be like if the wood didn't take a while to heat up. We have that kind of wood. It's called dynamite. (laughs) And it wouldn't go well to throw dynamite into that stove. (laughs) There's nothing wrong with the wood taking a moment to heat up, even hours. What can you do during that time? Nothing. It's not so bad. Just leave it. It'll figure itself out. The same way we sit down for hours. We just... uh, with no concern about whether something has happened yet. 
We just stay with it. And probably some of you, even just in that one little breath, could already feel a shift just because of the state of mind that I was in while I was breathing in that way. State of mind of patience, of non-concern, non-grasping, non-conflict, non-rushing. It changes everything, and then suddenly a natural process can unfold. I know it's confusing that by doing something in a way that is development and cultivation, suddenly something shifts. I know, it's so confusing. Didn't you just say that it isn't about things happening suddenly? Well, this is just how it is. If we're willing to let it happen on its own time, suddenly the right thing happens at this time. It happens right now. And that is where this ultimately leads when we get to the end of this. <coughs> Realizing for himself, not through the words of someone else, not through concepts that we've learned, not through something we've achieved. Realizing for ourselves with direct knowledge, not just mental understanding and not even just insight knowledge. This direct knowledge is direct knowledge. Now the nuns, as you have seen, they made the claim that they, had, that they knew that as it really is. But it should be known that in this tradition there are three different kinds of knowledge, two different levels of knowledge. There's one learned knowledge, so that's just something that we heard from somebody and we can believe it or not. The next is insight knowledge. That means that we've entered samadhi and then we can see it for ourselves. But then there's a deeper knowledge of, the, of direct experience, which is unmistaken. And that's what's called path knowledge. It means we're truly on the path. So this point, that finally we're going even beyond what the nuns have claimed that they have realized, going even beyond that, there is the direct and true realization. When does that happen? And where does that happen? It says so, here and now. We don't have to wait for heaven. We don't have to wait until after we die or something like that. Here and now, we, entered upon, we enter upon and abide in the deliverance of mind and deliverance by wisdom. Here and now. The Buddha was clear that this teaching can be verified here and now. That's one of the definitions of this teaching. If it can't be verified here and now, it's not part of this teaching. We can verify it, or you could just as well say, disprove it. Here and now. It doesn't have to be someone else. It doesn't have to be somewhere else. It doesn't have to be at some other time. Here and now, it's possible to enter upon and abide in the deliverance of mind, liberation of mind, deliverance by wisdom, <clears throat> through wisdom, our minds are liberated, that are taintless, <clears throat> completely beyond every flaw with the destruction of the taints, the asavas, the uh, toxins, the fundamental problems, uh, craving, for sensual pleasures, the desire to exist, and ignorance. Before we continue on, while this statement, this sentence is brilliant and is repeated again and again through the canon, we should note that there is an issue with it in this particular case. And what is that issue? It's actually a well-known issue. Anyone notice the problem with the way this is phrased in this particular case? Can you repeat what? Can you repeat yes, <clears throat> sisters, there are these seven enlightenment factors through the development and cultivation of which a monk, by realizing for himself with direct knowledge, here and now, enters upon and abides in the deliverance of mind and deliverance by wisdom that are taintless with the destruction of the taints. Anything incongruous there? Yes. Is it that he's talking to nuns and it's in the masculine? Exactly. So there are a number of explanations for why that may be the case. Um, and it's been noticed. Uh, you know, we're not the first people to notice it. Um, it seems strange. Why would he refer to it in that way? Uh, <clears throat> the most common explanation given is that <clears throat> uh, 
In most cases, when this is stated, it's stated by the Buddha to monks, since the Buddha was mostly teaching monks, uh, since those are the people he lived with. Uh, the monks and the nuns lived separately, and he was a monk. <clears throat> so he was mostly with them, and we're mostly quoting him when he says this sentence. And so he typically said, monk, bhikkhu, himself. Uh, <clears throat> <coughs> Since this was transmitted orally, a very useful thing to do when something's transmitted orally is to have stock phrases, stock sections that you simply repeat again and again, and this sentence is one of those. When something's a stock uh, phrase, a stock uh, uh, paragraph, a stock section, you just repeat it the same way every time, and that's the point of it. And so it's hard to have two different versions of that stock phrase. Uh, so you see, when we have the special parts of the sutta that aren't in other suttas, it is connected, uh, it's relevant, it's, it's appropriate to the circumstance. Uh, but in this case, we, we have now moved into a different kind of material. This entire section is simply repeated verbatim in, in many other texts. And so it would be easy as we are reciting it and reciting it to fall back into those patterns. However, it's inappropriate. Uh, and so uh, it makes sense to consider that carefully and be sure that this is, uh, that we, we can go the extra mile or or footstep, and uh, have this be in the appropriate gender. Uh, <clears throat> what are the seven? What are these seven? What are these seven enlightenment factors? Here, sisters, a bhikkhuni, a nun, develops the mindfulness enlightenment factor. The mindfulness enlightenment factor, which is supported by seclusion, dispassion, and cessation, and ripens in relinquishment. We don't have time right now to go into the meaning of seclusion, dispassion, cessation, and relinquishment. Basically, it means let go. I will give a short, my commentary on the phrase will be shorter than the phrase. Let go. But <clears throat> mindfulness is worth exploring. Mindfulness means <coughs> <coughs> that whatever's happening, we know it's happening. We're present for it. We remember to pay attention. That's what mindfulness means. The word sati or smriti means you remember to pay attention. You remember how to look at things. That there's a certain way of looking at things and you look at things in that way. For example, when walking, know you're walking. Remember to pay attention to walking. Remember to observe walking. Remember to notice that as you're walking, it's a constant demonstration of impermanence. This footstep happens and it's gone. This footstep happens and it's gone. This footstep happens and it's gone. There's a constant demonstration of impermanence as you're walking. And how do you know that? Because you're paying attention to it. And how do you pay attention? Because you remember to pay attention. You consistently remember to do it. This mindfulness means that we're aware if we're standing, that we're standing. If we're sitting, we know we're sitting. If we're lying down, we know we're lying down. If we're eating, we know we're eating. If we're defecating, we know we're defecating. <clears throat> if we're speaking, we know we're speaking. If we're listening, we know we're listening. If we're breathing in, we know we're breathing in. If we're breathing out, we know we're breathing out. If we're seeing, we know we're seeing. If we're hearing, we know we're hearing. If we're feeling, we know we're, he we're feeling. Constantly, we're aware of exactly what's happening right now. Constantly mindful, present, clear in our comprehension and awareness of the circumstance and of our activity at this moment, here and now. <clears throat> this itself is an enormous practice, and it takes development. And sometimes we're annoyed that it hasn't finished yet. Why am I not perfectly mindful all the time yet, we ask. Simple, because we haven't developed and cultivated it sufficiently yet. We come to the point when we can develop and cultivate it, and once we have developed it sufficiently, then we can develop the investigation of state's enlightenment factor. This means a curiosity, an amazement, a wonder, a fascination. To be so infused by curiosity that everything that happens seems interesting. 
whatever it is that's interesting. If we're relating with someone, relating with someone is so interesting. If we're not relating to anyone, not relating to anyone is so interesting. Somebody talks about uh, the weather, the weather is so interesting. Someone talks about their past, their past is so interesting. Someone's interested in us, we're so interesting. People have <coughs> asked me, and I've actually included in our schools program, this point. Uh, it is, it is uh, for me and Shinzen, uh, people ask how we know so much about so much. I don't think I know all that much about all that much, but people ask the question. And the reason that I've heard him give and the reason that I give, that I describe in the schools program, is not at all that we're naturally intelligent. I don't think he is. Actually, I know him pretty well, and I know I'm not. In school, I had to work very hard. I don't have natural intelligence at all. But both of us give the same answer because we think everything's interesting. Everything's interesting. I was having a conversation with someone about <coughs> aluminum and what happens to it chemically when it heats. I think that's really interesting. I never knew I thought that was interesting. If you had asked me, well, as soon as you asked me, I would have thought it was interesting. But if you could have asked me without telling me what you're asking about, I would never have known that aluminum was interesting until this morning when someone brought it up to me. And suddenly, aluminum was very interesting. And I learned all kinds of things about aluminum this morning, in a short time, because I was so fascinated by it. Aluminum is a really interesting metal. You all should look it up. <laughs> so, when I say that, are you interested? If you're interested, then you can use that to pay attention to exactly what's happening. Because you want to know exactly what the real thing is. What really happens to aluminum when you heat it? Really. Of course, people think all kinds of stuff, but what about really? And you want to know. And you're excited by the fact that there doesn't seem to be any horizon to that question. Is there any end to learning about what happens to aluminum when you heat it? Probably not. What if you heat it up even more? You could heat it up to, say, 300 degrees. That would be interesting. Or 500. Hmm, also interesting. 800, 1,000, 2,000. Now, 2,000 is interesting because at that point it will have melted. But wait, you could bring it to boiling. That would be interesting. And that's not the end. What if you put it at the center of the sun? What would happen to it then? That would be very interesting. And there are actually temperatures higher than that. Hmm. All of it's interesting. You can just keep going and going and going. But just being interested isn't sufficient for this investigation of states. It also means that we want to know what's really happening. And too often, as I know that this happens, there are people in this very room who are experiencing this right now, I'm asking them to cultivate the investigation of states enlightenment factor. But the experience is not, <clears throat> oh, how interesting this is. The experience is, I don't understand what's going on at all, so I'm a failure. Well, that's how we don't learn. This is a developed skill. Again, it's not like the fire. Or it's not like the way we often treat the fire. It is like the fire. You put the wood in, and then it takes some time to heat up. <coughs> we want to investigate. It takes time. Slowly, we start to see what's really going on. At first, it's not at all clear. And then after that, it's even less clear. The closer you look, the less certain you are. But we often think, well, I've been looking at this for quite a while now, almost an hour. And I'm not clear at all. So I'm a failure. This is not a helpful approach. On the contrary, you know what would be really interesting? Examine that. Why did I just think that? What predicated that? What's the consequence of that? Such a simple thought. Do I think that thought a lot? Is that thought relevant? Is it accurate? Does anyone else believe that? This is so interesting. What an amazing thought. I'm a failure. I had no idea that there were so many interesting parts of that thought. Of course, we haven't even gotten started. It goes much further than that. Have you considered that those are just sounds? 
What if you didn't hear words in those sounds? Right? What happened then? For example, for you, what's the difference <coughs> between uh, watashi wa wakaru and watashi wa wakarunai? Watashi ga shibai suru. Shibai shita. Hmm? Big emotional reactions? <laughs> no, because you know that in reality, the Japanese language is just a bunch of sounds. We attribute meaning to them. The meaning isn't just there. In the same way, you can say, I'm a failure. I don't understand. I'm no good. But there's an emotional reaction there because we attribute meaning to it. But if you investigate it, you can see the difference between the sound and the meaning. If you really investigate. There was a time <clears throat> when I was teaching Mind the Music to a group of teens. Mind the Music means that the teens can listen to whatever music they like and we're mindful of it. Mindful of how it makes us feel, for example. So we were listening to a certain song and <clears throat> the instruction was, attend to the song, be mindful of the sound of the song. And one of the adults in the uh, youth center that I was teaching in came to learn about Mind the Music, see what I was doing. And <clears throat> he came in and I asked him what his experience was and he said, it was hard to listen to the music because I kept on hearing the words. Now that right there was a lot to investigate. Just. <laughs> I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave most of the investigation aside right now. I'm just going to set a, a lot of it aside, but you all can investigate that statement. It's incredible how much material there is in that simple response. It's amazing. But I'll move on to the response given to that statement by one of the teens, Muhammad, who said, what? Listen, man. If you're really listening, you don't hear words. <laughs> <laughs> this is the investigation of state's enlightenment factor. We can see clearly that the sounds are sounds. What is it that attributes meaning to those sounds? How does that happen? And how does that attribution impact our bodies? All of that can be investigated bit by bit. It's not investigated by putting dynamite into the stove. It's investigated by putting wood in and then letting it gradually heat, gradually move through its own natural process. <laughs> Having done that, once we start to actually see, and this can be a struggle, but once we start to actually see what's happening, we, uh, we attune with, we come into harmony with it. And because of that, a completely new phenomenon takes place, which many of you have experienced, but it's necessary to cultivate this. And that's the energy enlightenment factor. Once we're seeing things as they are, you know what it's like when you're interested in something and you're really seeing it, whatever it is, it could be something intellectual, it could be something physical, in any case, you're engaged in it. And out of nowhere, a kind of energy emerges. You're excited about it. You're infused with energy and it fills you. In that same way, as we do this, if we give it time, if we don't rush it and force it and fight with it and try to beat it into submission, not doing that, but giving into it, a new energy emerges. That energy grows and grows and grows and grows and grows until it starts to push on the edges of our self-conscious awareness. And our self-conscious awareness tries to beat it down and say, no, don't push on me. But it continues to grow. Self-conscious, no, don't be so energetic. I'm afraid of what will happen if I let this energy move. No, 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 calm down. <laughs> and it keeps on growing and growing and growing. And once it breaks through, once it punctures like a chick out of the shell, once it punctures that self-conscious awareness, and a new kind of rapture, pleasure, amazement, exhilaration emerges in which everything is incredible. Everything is amazing. Everything is joyous. We see the floor. It's incredible. We always took it for granted. We could just see the floor. Why did we take that for granted? There was no reason to take it for granted. No one ever promised us we could see the floor. No one ever said, good news, you're always going to be able to see the floor. But this moment we can see the floor. It's incredible. 
This moment we can hear the wind. This moment we can feel our bodies breathing. How could it happen? We don't know. And there's a vast joy of just being alive. But even this rapture, this rapture continues to mature, continues to cultivate. Because even this rapture is almost overwhelming. It's almost a racking kind of joy. It's exhausting. And so slowly, as it moves through us, as it fills us, as it purifies us, it purifies us even of the sense that it's amazing. And then the same joy remains, but in a way that's calm and tranquil and clear. There's a pleasure that we could not possibly imagine. The rapture enlightenment factor can't be understood, but the tranquility enlightenment factor can't be imagined. We couldn't conceive of it even if we tried for millions of years. This tranquility is unknown. That's why in writing about this myself in a poem that I wrote, I said, joy is wonderful, but somehow peace is more wonderful. Somehow, mysteriously, this tranquility give us a kind of pleasure that shifts everything. And then we're back again to being a toddler. Because this tranquility pulls us in moment by moment by moment. Not because we're forcing ourselves to concentrate, but concentration emerges because why would we ever leave this tranquility? We don't have any desire to leave it. On the contrary, the investigation of states is interested in what is it that would pull me away from this and how can I resolve that right away so I can stay here in this subtle, incomprehensible peace. How can that be done? The example that I often give <coughs> is that I was over the holidays with my family. My mother often takes care of my nephew, whose name is Obadiah, or Obi. My mother had saved a holiday cookie for Obi in a clear plastic bag, and while she was moving things around unintentionally, she revealed it to him, and when he saw it, you could see the investigation of state's cookie factor <laughs> burst forth. Yes, how will I get that cookie? <laughs> she didn't need to say, <clears throat> okay, Obi, cultivate concentration on the cookie. <laughs> no, he had plenty of concentration on that cookie. <laughs> you could see his whole, his whole body shifting <laughs> to the cookie. A cookie was the whole world. Why would you pay attention to anything other than that cookie? The cookie is the purpose of life. And he said, naturally, can I have that cookie? And she said, very naturally, being an adult, well, I saved it for you, but first we should eat lunch. And at the end of lunch, we can have the cookie. Well, it was 10 o'clock. Lunch is hours away. And then it's after lunch. That for a toddler is never. That's never going to happen. It's just how we should be in this practice. I'll get enlightened after lunch. That's never. That's just never. No, this morning is what it has to happen. Fulfill the concentration this morning. What? Because he knows what could happen. He knows he might forget. He knows how that works. She might be tricking me. I might not get it after lunch. <laughs> she might forget. This is not safe. This is not appropriate. The cookie needs to be eaten now. Otherwise, it might not get eaten. <laughs> In the same way, we need to get enlightened now. We need to concentrate now. We need to do this now. Otherwise, it might not happen. Too risky. That cookie has frosting on it. Okay? It has to be eaten now. So he said, um, now? <laughs> and she said, compromising, well, first, let's clean up this mess that we made. We made it together, and after we clean up the mess, then you can have the cookie. She said, okay, what if we 
eat the cookie, and then clean up the mess. <laughs> yes. So smart. See how powerful this investigation of state's enlightenment factor is. It can do anything, even break down a tough old woman. <laughs> she said, no, first we should clean up the mess. He said, okay, you clean up the mess. <laughs> I'll eat the cookie. <laughs> he figured it out. <laughs> well, <clears throat> I'm going to skip ahead. But he got the cookie. Yeah, he, he won that one. He got that cookie. And he sort of helped clean up the mess. Enough. You know how it is. You can't say he didn't clean up the mess. But <laughs> mm, he more or less didn't clean up the mess. He did, however, with full concentration. Total engagement. No reservation. Eat that cookie. He ate the cookie wholeheartedly. This concentration can burst forth with its full power because we're no longer on the outside making ourselves concentrate. Will you concentrate, please? Okay, stop being distracted and concentrate because we're drawn into it from the inside, drawn in through the tranquility. Since we're drawn in, there no longer is a fight, which means that this concentration is in no way contrary to equanimity, and equanimity as an enlightenment factor bursts forth as well. And through the interaction of concentration and equanimity, through the constant uh, interweaving of the investigation of states, we finally, which Shinzen calls clarity, we finally have concentration, clarity, and equanimity, and they working together result in this prajna, this true wisdom that cuts through the hindrances. Therefore, we have <clears throat> the equanimity enlightenment factor supported by seclusion, dispassion, and cessation, ripens in relinquishment. These are the seven enlightenment factors through the development and cultivation of which Habakuni, by realizing for herself with direct knowledge, here and now, here and now, you see, now we're even before a toddler, because he couldn't eat the cookie here and now. He still had to get out of the plastic bag. But now we're talking about here and now. That's faster than even what Obi thought was right now. Enters upon and abides in the deliverance of mind and deliverance by wisdom that are taintless with the destruction of the taints. At this time, he finished his lecture and he dismissed them, saying, Go, sisters, it is time. Uh, this is obviously uh, a problem in the text because previously he went to them. Uh, so again, I think it's just that as this was repeated, um, we went back to the stock way that it's done. Typically, the Buddha would be speaking to the monks, and then at, they might come to his residence, and then he would say, go, it's time, and then people would leave. That's the normal way that lectures end. So probably in this case, he then got up and went back to the monastery. But in any case. The Blessed One addressed the bhikkhus. Bhikkhus, just as on the Oposita day of the 14th, this is the 14th of the month, and a month is a moon month, not our month. People are not doubtful or perplexed as to whether the moon is incomplete or full, since the, the moon is clearly incomplete. So too, these bhikkhunis are satisfied with Nandaka's teaching, but their intention has not yet been fulfilled. So, two things here. One is, at that time, as is normal for human beings, it's completely clear on the 14th whether the moon is full or not. For modern people, we're often confused about that. I've been outside with people who, don't, who can't tell if the moon is full or not, looking at it and not sure. That's actually where we've come to at this point in history. And I've seen, this is literally true, I have seen this. I can tell you when and where I saw it because it struck me so much if you want to ask some other time. Someone literally got out their phone to look to see if the moon was full. They were looking at the moon, unclear, took out their phone, and realized it's not going to be full until tomorrow. However, at this time in history, they were very clear. They could know it's not full. However, they were clear about that. In the same way, the bhikkhunis were clear about this experience, about the 
lecture about the dialogue, but it hadn't yet been fulfilled in the same way that the moon wasn't yet full. So he said, teach exactly the same thing tomorrow. Again, this is about development. It's not about, let's do something new and better. Let's have a new and improved version. Do the same thing again until it's fulfilled. So he said, yes, he did it. The entire sutra is repeated in this repeat verbatim portion. Everything is just repeated again. And then after they left, ah, before we get to that, it says here their intention has not yet been fulfilled. I would ask you before we move on, uh, what do you think their intention was? I'll give you a few seconds to answer this in your own mind. Then the Buddha said, just as on the opposite day of the 15th, people are not doubtful or perplexed as to whether the moon is incomplete or full, since the moon is, is clearly full. So too, these bhikkhunis are satisfied with Nandaka's teaching of the, of the Dharma, and their intention has been fulfilled. Now we learn about their intention according to this text. Even the least advanced of these 500 bhikkhunis is a stream enterer, which is to say, person <coughs> uh, of the first stage of awakening. <coughs> and then we end again in the typical way. That is what the Blessed One said. The bhikkhus were satisfied and delighted in his words. So it says here that the least advanced of these bhikkhunis is a stream enterer, and their intention was fulfilled. That means that they that their intent was to was stream entry, was initial awakening, not complete awakening. Uh, <clears throat> of course, many of them, according to this text, would have gone further than that. And also, of course, stream entry is a very lofty goal. Uh, we shouldn't think it's not. There are few stream enterers alive today. Uh, it's not a common depth of awakening. It's extraordinary. 